This is part two of the project management slide deck. And in this slide deck, I want to talk about the uh, some of the tools that we have for project management. So I talked about the methodology. I talked about the, uh, the overall process of project management. Those four phases, if you recall, which were planning, uh, I'm sorry, initiation, planning, execution, and close down. And I fully described those four. So now let's talk about the planning phase of project management, where we have to estimate the time to complete tasks and we want to create these different diagrams. So I touched on some of these diagrams before. For example, I talked about Gantt charts in the previous slide deck. I talked about network diagrams. Uh, I mentioned the PERT calculations, but I didn't talk about what they are and how they work. Pretty critical path scheduling, project management software, and so forth. So in this part, let's talk about some of these tools and techniques that we have to do this. So a Gantt chart is basically a, uh, is a chart that shows you task durations, and they show time overlap between different tasks and they show time, uh, they show slack time in duration between tasks, so where we can sort of move tasks around and still meet our project goals. A network diagram is a little bit different. This shows our task dependencies uh, as opposed to the timing of those tasks, uh, but it does not show time overlap. In, in fact, a network diagram doesn't really show time at all. We don't care about how long it takes to complete a task in the network diagram. All we care about is which tasks can be completed in parallel and what tasks rely on a previous task. So what task has to be get done or be completed before we can start the next task. So that's really the purpose of a network diagram. Um, we could show slack time in boxes, uh, but that's not typical. So here's two examples. The one on the top is a Gantt chart. The one on the bottom is a network diagram. Um, these are both from a product called Microsoft Project, which I'll talk about towards the end of the slide deck. That's one of the software applications that we can use for project management. It's probably one of the most common out there for project management. But let's start with a network diagram. This is the most basic example of what a network diagram might look like. All you're doing with a network diagram, now before I talk about the network diagram, there's one piece that I didn't talk about yet, which is the work breakdown structure, or a WBS. So let me talk about that first. A WBS is a list, is where you list all of your tasks, and you break them down to whatever level of granularity is appropriate for this particular project. And, um, and you break down all those tasks. The next step, after we have our list of tasks, you're basically going to take each one of those tasks and you're going to put a little bubble uh, in, in some diagramming software. Now I'm going to show you how to do this. I'm going to probably show you how to do this with Draw.io. Um, there's a free product online called uh, Team Gantt that you could do something like this with as well although uh, draw.io is pretty easy, but basically you're going to put a little bubble on for each task on this chart, and you're going to say, okay, which one of these is the first task? So that's going to be, you know, project A, for example, might be task number one. And then once project A is done, what other task can I begin? And project, you know, task B, might you might be able to begin that. Uh, task D, you might be able to begin uh, so if you look at the example on the screen here, task B is, so task A is the system design, and then task B is writing programs, and task D is writing documentation. And theoretically, they could both kick off at the same time. Now, testing the program cannot complete until we've written the program, right? You can't really test anything until you've written something, right? At least from a very high level, a basic, you know, from a very basic level, that, that's kind of how it works. Uh, so that is dependent. So C is dependent on B, which is dependent on A. So C cannot start until B completes, and B cannot start until A completes. Now, finally, installing the system, we can't do that unless we've tested everything, right? So there's one dependency, but also uh, we have to have our documentation. We can't install it without the help of some people would argue with me on that, but uh, we really should not or ought not to start the installation until everything's fully documented. Um, so that has two dependencies, both C and D. So the basic idea here with the network diagram, this is all a network diagram is, and, and please don't confuse network diagram and project management with a network diagram and IT. They're very different, right? So a lot of you probably you know, have done network diagrams in, in the IT world, right, in information technology, but that's not what this is. It's the use of the term network is in a different context here, and it is how the different tasks relate to each other. That's the most important takeaway with a network diagram. If I asked you on a test, what, what is a network diagram in project management? You would tell me it shows how tasks are related, what the dependencies are, right? That's pretty much all it does. It's a nice visual representation of how everything is related. So that is a network diagram. 
Now, once we have, now it, go, going back to the work breakdown structure, again, the WBS is simply a list of all of the tasks. So first we brainstorm this list of tasks. The next step is we think about how those tasks relate to one another, and that's the network diagram I just showed you. The next step is to do a, a, an analysis of on how long it's going to take for each task to complete. Now, one of the common ways to do this, uh, there's this concept called the Program Evaluation Review Technique, or a PERT analysis. Um, it's kind of strange. This is really just a fancy way of saying a uh, weighted, uh, weighted average, <laughs> right? Um, really, all you're doing is you're thinking about what you have to do is come up with, you know, realistically, how long is this project going to take realistically, right? So take something like making your bed in the morning, right? Making your bed realistically should take no more than three minutes, right? Now, optimistically, if you're, uh, you know, you're having a great day, you woke up with a lot of energy, maybe you can make your bed in 30 seconds. Other days you wake up and you just don't want to get out of bed, right? It's a rainy day. It just, it's not nice out. You don't really have any fun planned today. You just got to go to school or whatever. Um, so pessimistically on a day like that, you may never make your bed, right? But we'll say pessimistically, it's going to take you five minutes, right? So realistically, it's, you know, no more than a couple of minutes. Optimistically, you know, maybe 30 seconds, less than a minute. And pessimistically, you know, up to five minutes because you just don't feel like doing it. So when we have all those times. Basically, we, uh, we use a little formula. Our estimated time would be optimistic plus four times realistic plus pessimistic divided by six, and that gives us a weighted average. And as you can see here, the average is weighted heavily towards the realistic estimate. So what this allows us to do is take our realistic estimate and use that as the basis of our time estimate. But then um, you know, we could take that pessimistic and optimistic and use that to kind of skew our estimate a little bit. If our optimistic is a really low number because we've seen this get done very quickly before, but it doesn't usually get done that fast, that might pull our time estimate down just a little bit from the realistic because maybe, you know, chances are we will finish a little bit faster than we thought. But maybe the pessimistic is something out of our control that could take a really long time. Like, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you have to wait for something to get shipped to us. And, you know, realistically, it should take, you know, three days when you order something on Amazon, it should take three days for it to show up. Or if you order it on Alibaba, if you're in China, um, you know, maybe realistically, it should take three days for that to arrive. But, pessimistically, uh, you know, with the delivery companies and all that stuff, you know, maybe it's going to take, um, you know, it could take up to two weeks for that to arrive, you know, depending on where you live, you know, maybe they're just kind of flaky where you live delivery services. So you just don't know. So, you know, normally it takes two to three days, but every once in a while, like maybe every 10th thing that you order takes 10 days to get there instead. So that's going to weight our estimate a little bit high. Um, that way we can cover for that uh, possibility. And of course, we're doing this for every single task, right? So take a look at this little spreadsheet here. In our work breakdown structure, we are going to take every single task and we're going to do this analysis to try to figure out the, uh, uh, you know, a rough estimate on the time it's going to take. And you can see here in this estimate uh, that most of these are pretty close to the realistic, right? So look at task one. It's exactly the same as realistic task two, task three, and so forth. Uh, but then we get to task five and you can see that the uh, pessimistic time I'm sorry, the realistic time being so much shorter pulls that time down a little bit, right? But the rest are all pretty much right on the realistic time estimate. Uh, but so in the aggregate, usually this should be correct in aggregate, right? So maybe some of these will slip a little bit. Some of these will get done a little bit faster than we thought. But overall, we should be pretty close to schedule if we did our due diligence in measuring this time. So that is our PERT analysis. So now that we have a combination of our uh, of our work breakdown structure, which tells us how long the tasks are going to take, and we have our network diagram telling us how those tasks are related, we can also get a feeling, uh, a feel for what our critical path is. The critical path is basically um, all the tasks that string together that must be completed to complete the project. It's the longest string of tasks, right? The longest um, succession of tasks that string together that define the shortest amount of time that we could complete the project. In other words, there may be other things that happen outside of that critical path that you know could happen a little early, they could happen a little bit later, they could happen in the middle of the project, it doesn't matter. And if you, if you shift that entire you know, path, uh, sequence of events for one of these other tasks, 
it may not affect the rest of the project, right? We might have something that we could do it now or we can do it three weeks from now. It doesn't matter. Um, that little section of, of tasks is not really going to affect our overall project. But that critical path is sort of the main, um, the main tasks that all get strung together that define the shortest amount of time. So there's two things happening here. It's the longest uh, or the most number of tasks usually that are dependent on one another or the longest amount of time that tasks are dependent upon one another. And, that, and, and when you figure that out, that is the shortest amount of time that you could possibly complete this project, no matter what you do, um, because all of that stuff has to get done. And a lot of times, this critical path is a lot easier to see on a Gantt than it is on a network when you're trying to think conceptually about a network diagram. So our book, if you're reading Modern Systems Analysis and Design, which I'm basing the slide deck on, um, you know, I, I, if I wrote that book, I probably would have put the Gantt chart uh, ahead of, you know, I would have talked about a work breakdown structure and then a PERT analysis, then a network diagram, and then I would do a Gantt chart because then everything becomes clear when you put it on a Gantt chart. And you'll see that when I show you a real, a kind of a real world example of that. Um, so, you know, for example, this is um, uh, a list of all of our tasks and how they're dependent upon, you know, which ones are dependent upon other tasks. And it's really kind of hard to see here what, what the critical path is. But when we put that on a, on a network diagram, it becomes a little bit more obvious what that critical path is. Um, so again, that critical path, we're going to calculate the earliest possible completion time for each activity uh, by summing the activity times in the longest path to the activity. Uh, and this gives the total expected project time. And that is our critical path. So really what critical path comes down to is how long is this entire project going to take? And the way to determine that is figure out what the critical path is. Uh, and the critical path will give you the shortest amount of time that you could possibly complete this project. All right. And by the way, there's no slack time in the critical path either. So here we see that same uh, network diagram where we begin to put the uh, the time estimates on here. Uh, and we can start to see that critical path emerging because we can see what the longest tasks are to complete that are dependent upon previous tasks. And again, you could do this with the network diagram as you see it here and in the textbook. But I find it a little bit easier to put this into a Gantt chart, um, which I'll show you in the uh, in the in an interactive video. I'll show you a little bit about how to create Gantt charts, and you'll start to see that critical path emerge a little bit easier in the Gantt chart. I think it, it it's much more evident when you put this on a Gantt chart. All right. So finally, we have project management software, which uh, uh, there's a lot of project management software out there that you can use to assist in project management. Microsoft Project is probably one of the most common. Uh, so uh, with Project Manage, with Microsoft Project, you put in a start and an end date. You establish all of your tasks and your task dependencies, just like we talked about. You follow the same procedure. Um, you can view the project. Once you put all that stuff in, you don't have to create your Gantt chart or your network diagram because by entering in the task and by entering in the time for that task and by telling the computer which tasks are dependent upon which other tasks, you know, this task has to happen, then the next task, and so forth, it can take that and automatically generate a network diagram and automatically generate a Gantt chart for you. So you can see it visually, you get this visual representation of your entire project. And as you're managing the project, as you're going through this project and you're dynamically changing these things, you'll see that Gantt chart automatically change. You'll see that critical path automatically change. So if somebody slips on a certain task, and it goes a little long, you'll see the, the you know, the, the completion date will push past what you had anticipated as the completion date. And then you can start looking at other tasks and say, okay, what other tasks could I shave some time off of to uh, to make it more likely that I'm going to meet the, uh, the project completion timeline? Uh, and you can kind of shift things around. You can talk to people and say, hey, look, I, I, I budgeted eight hours for this task, but can you get it done in four? Uh, can you get it done in six? You know, maybe you can get three or four tasks to shave off an hour and a half from the task to try to move that project plan. Uh, and again, a good project manager will usually work in some slack time into individual tasks uh, so they have that flexibility. You know, hopefully that'll help them move things down. Um, it always seems like every time I'm managing a project, if I work in slack time to all of my tasks, I end up using it all somewhere, right? Um, somehow it gets used, so you never want to just have you know, the exact amount of time to complete a certain task. But again, the PERT analysis should help you do that a little bit. And again, I'll show you, um, I'll show you an example of doing Gantt charts, I think, in a, uh, in a different video. So again, lots of tools out there. Your book talks about some modern systems analysis and design, 
by Valachik talks about, and, uh, and George, uh, Joey George, talks about uh, uh, project management software from Microsoft. There are other ones out there that you can use. Um, there are free ones online that you can use that are pretty decent. Team Gantt, I've mentioned a number of times, you can set up a free account on there and you can try it for a while and see how it works for you. Um, but they do try to get you to pay for it, I think, after you use it for a little while. But you can certainly get your feet wet trying it. Uh, with project management software, I think if you were to purchase Modern Systems Analysis and Design 8th Edition, brand new from the publisher, they give you a license. I think they give you a 90-day uh, Microsoft Project license that you can use. Although I'm sure you can probably get a 90-day evaluation of uh, Microsoft Project directly from Microsoft if you wanted to, unless you've done it before. So in this, uh, in this unit, we've talked about um, explaining the process of managing an information systems project. We talked about those four phases, the initiation, planning, execution, and close down of the project. Then I described everything in that planning process, right? So I talked about Gantt charts and network diagrams and what they do and how we use these different tools and techniques to manage a project and risk assessment and things like that, although I really didn't give risk assessment justice in this lecture. Um, but there are other courses you can take about risk management for sure, which I highly recommend if you're going to be managing projects and uh, doing uh, systems analysis. And then finally, I talked about some of the, uh, uh, the way some of these management uh, or project management software packages work and how you can use them to help manage your project. Although you don't have to use them, you can certainly do it in Microsoft Excel if you wanted to uh, or something along those lines. So that's it. So that's everything that we need to know in systems analysis and design. This is a, kind of a basic overview of project planning. And in the next slide deck uh, after this one, so the next unit of material that we'll cover is going to talk about project selection and initiating that information systems project. So we'll talk about starting that project and selecting projects uh, and some of the analysis we have to do with feasibility. So we'll talk about technical, operational, political, and, and uh, economic feasibility analysis.